Hello, Facebook family, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Nash at Noon. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late today, but today we're going to be looking at a song that we're going to be using this Sunday in our worship service, just like we do every Thursday. And today we're going to be looking at a song that virtually everyone knows. It, honestly, if you're a believer or not, people know this song. It was written over 240 years ago by one of the most notorious sinners of his time. What I want to do today is I want to see if you can guess the song from its story, okay? I can't tell you the guy who wrote it because that would give it away. But the man who wrote it was born in the early 1700s to a devoutly church-going mother and a father who was a sea captain. His mother passed away while he was at a young age, and honestly, this man's stepmother and his father weren't real serious about him going to church and so really the the role that faith played in his life declined rapidly and honestly he had a troubled childhood he was constantly getting into trouble uh, left and right and when he was 19 years old he was basically kidnapped and forced to be a crew member on a ship he transferred to many other ships and eventually made his way to the slave trade. Now, the slave trade was two things during this time period. First of all, it was brutal. The conditions that those slaves were transported in was horrible, to say the very least. But secondly, it was also very profitable. This man continued to work hard and party hard and honestly openly mocked anyone who believed in Jesus Christ. But God loved him too much to leave him where he was. In 1748, he was aboard a slave ship that sailed into a huge storm. Honestly, it was all the crew could do to keep the ship afloat. As a matter of fact, crew members were swept overboard during the storm. And as they worked through the night feverishly trying to keep that ship afloat, this man was afraid he was going to die. And if he was going to die, he wanted to be right with God. He, he took an honest look at things. Sometimes it takes that near-death experience for people to take an honest look about where they are in life and where they fall short. And he became a believer that night. He became a believer that night because he remembered the words of his mother who died so long ago. He survived the storm and was really a changed man. I mean, it didn't happen overnight. But his life was completely transformed. Eventually, he not only gave up life in the slave trading world, he gave up his life as a sailor and actually became a pastor. In his later years, he became a pastor in the city of London where he preached the gospel to the same men who had heard him mocking Jesus earlier in his life. This hymn was written later in his life, and it really describes a very personal journey out of spiritual blindness into the light of God's grace. Do you know the name of the song yet? I bet you do. Well, the sailor turned pastor's name was a guy named John Newton. He was later instrumental. Sorry about that. He was later instrumental in abolishing the slave trade in England and making it illegal. And the song, Amazing Grace. I mean, we all know that song, right? You know, if you're a believer and have been for any time, you've probably sung it hundreds, if not thousands of times. I mean, a lot of people call it kind of the national anthem of the Christian faith, and I understand that, and it really is a very popular song, and, and the reason it's such a popular song is because the truth that's found there is absolutely, well, amazing. It's astounding. When we think about the grace of God, it is truly amazing. You know, I want to challenge us today. This is a song, again, that we all know well, that we've all heard hundreds of times, maybe even sung thousands of times. If you were to do a, a top ten list, so to speak, of the most recorded songs of all time, this one comes in the list at number three. So it's very well known. And, and you notice I don't have a screen behind me because we don't need the words to this song. Most people know it and know it well. But my challenge for us today is I want us to look at this song through fresh eyes. I want us to look at this song through new eyes that will enable us to truly see it for the amazing song that it is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of men and women in our past. 
in our own personal lives as well in the history of our world who have lived your, your lifestyle, who have lived their faith in you so well and so strongly that they become these inspirations to us. And Father, I just pray that you will help us to see this song, see these lyrics with new eyes. Help us to hear your message in these lyrics. And Father, I just pray that you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, let's take a look at the words of this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I'm I see. I mean, you know, in, in the 21st century, honestly, thinking of somebody or describing somebody, if it's yourself or somebody else, as a wretch, it really isn't very politically correct, is it? Might not be PC, but you know what? <laughs> it's true. Without God, we are nothing. I mean, Isaiah 64, 6 tells us how our very best, the very best that we have to offer is but filthy rags compared to his glory. And let me tell you, I really think with all of my heart that that is an understatement. You know, the second part of this verse, verse is found at the end of Luke's telling of the prodigal son. And honestly, again, it's far more accurate than it necessarily might be uplifting to the lost. You know, when I was my own Lord, right? When, when Nash did whatever Nash wanted to do because Nash was living life for Nash. I was as lost as last year's Easter egg. And you know, them things stink. Spiritually speaking, them lost folks pretty much stink in Jesus' nostrils as well, don't they? Because our sin is so repulsive to him. But we are not repulsive to him. He loves us enough. And I know that because while we were still sinners, he died for us. Folks, that's love. That's grace. That's amazing grace. I think John Newton would agree wholeheartedly with all that I just said. Don't you think? But the reality is when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, it's like taking off a blindfold. It's like taking off blinders. It's like stepping out of the deep darkness into the light of the sun. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And we need to live our lives every day in light of that hope that's found in that simple little statement there. Because the reality is, when Christ is our Lord and Savior, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer lost because we have been found or we have found our Savior. The second verse says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved." How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. You know, the first line of this verse really is spot on. But at first glance, it really can be kind of confusing. But when we really think about it, it becomes clearer. What taught our heart to fear? Grace. What relieved our fear? Grace. How, how can that be? Well... When I first saw God for who he really is, you know, that glorious, gloriously powerful, that just God, it scared me because I knew his standards. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. I've known God's standards for my life all of my life. But even if, if somebody isn't blessed to have that same background and they first really read and comprehend and understand the standards that God holds us to, it can be scary. You know, but once we get to know that God, and we, once we realize, and once we really come to that understanding that that same gloriously powerful and just God loves us so much. How much? Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that whosoever should believe it in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad you're a whosoever? Because we all are. Because His grace is accessible to all of us. So that same grace, that same awe, and that same fear of God, that same biblical, healthy respect and fear of God, which once might have scared us, now makes us realize that our salvation is real. That same grace 
that taught my heart to fear has now set me free and relieved me of those fears. You know, when I realized this, that's really just a game changer for me. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus had this against the church in Ephesus, right? Do you remember this one? They had lost their first love. I mean, do you remember being on fire for Jesus when you were first saved? I mean, you know, I realize this world can be hard and, and we go through difficult and trying circumstances. Jesus was telling the truth when he said, in this life you will have trouble because let me tell you, life is tough. But the problem comes is when you allow the difficult circumstances of our lives to quench our fire for Jesus, those initial flames. I mean, I, I realize that it's really easy for us to become so accustomed to the fact of our salvation that we lose some of that awe, that we lose really that knowledge and that memory of what it was like before we were saved. Why do I talk about this? Why I think this is very important for us to remember what it was like to be lost. Not, not so we can beat ourselves up over our lostness in our former lives, but because we need to be passionate about evangelism. We need to be passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the reality is we run into lost people every single day. Well, Maybe not during a pandemic and a quarantine order. Maybe it's not every day. But then again, maybe it is. Because it could be your neighbor. It could be that person across the street. It could be that person that you saw in the grocery store when you were out doing your grocery shopping. Because we're surrounded by lost people, folks. You know the only difference between a lost person and a saved person? Acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how will they hear the gospel? unless God's children proclaim it. By the way, that's me and you. I know, now you say, Nashville, you're a pastor. It's your job to do that. Well, guess what? If you're a believer, it's your job too. And I am a believer, so it's my job to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of us are. And if we can remember what lostness is really like, and if we can remember that lost people, when they die, if they don't know Jesus, they go straight to hell. They go straight to torment for an eternity. And when we lose sight of that, we're in danger. We're in danger of losing sight of the purpose of our evangelism is to get people under the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need to share the gospel faithfully and passionately every opportunity that God gives us. And this last verse is just a glorious verse. It says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Let me ask you a question. Well, what's heaven going to be like? I don't know. I mean, the Bible gives us some hints. The Bible gives us some clues. But, you know, I really don't say, I don't see the Bible as painting the full picture of what heaven's going to be like. Here's my standard answer when I'm asked. If anybody ever asks me what heaven's going to be like, I'll say, well, I know it's going to be better than I can even imagine, no matter how good my imagination is. And I believe that with all my heart. There are going to be glorious and wonderful things there that never crossed my mind that I needed. But God, in His infinite love, will provide us with what we need. After all, if we look, take a look at our own faith journey, or, or as the faith journey is relayed in the Bible, God's always given people what they need. It might or might not be what they want, but He gives us what we need. If we think back to Jesus Christ, the Jews were looking for a Messiah to come and be a military leader, to get them out from under Roman rule. That's what they were looking for. That's what they wanted. But instead, God in His infinite wisdom sent them a Savior for their souls. What they need. And heaven's going to be just like that. He's going to give us everything that we need everything that we need in order to praise Him. It's a very similar question, though, with a very similar answer. How long is forever? <laughs> my brain cannot comprehend that. My, my brain that I have in this physical body cannot comprehend the concept of forever. Right? I, I remember when I was younger, I thought forever was English class, but that only lasted an hour. 
can we really wrap our brains around forever? I think the answer to that is no. And I think John Newton knew that as well because he says when we've been there 10,000 years, a time just that we cannot even begin to wrap our heads around. When we've been there in all the glories of heaven and as wonderful as it's going to be, you know, it will be just like we have just begun. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Life's hard. Sometimes I think my life is a little bit harder because of my faith. I find myself in circumstances that would be easier from a fleshly perspective to navigate if Nash did what Nash wanted to do instead of doing what God wants Nash to do. Now, now I know that's, that's kind of a weird thing to say when you're talking about evangelism, but the reality is it's really true. But see, here's the cool thing. Because of my relationship with Christ, a couple of things will happen for me while I'm here. I'll never walk through these situations alone, ever. He will always be with me. And he'll also give me the words I need to say. He'll give me the tools that I need in order to accomplish what he has led me to. That nowhere in there does it say it's going to be easy. But he's going to give us what we need to do what we've been called to do. But even more than that... I tell you, as a believer, the retirement plan is awesome because we get to spend eternity in heaven with him. Again, what does that look like? I I don't really know. I don't really understand eternity, but here's what I know. It's going to be better than I can imagine, no matter how good my imagination is. And it's going to last forever, as in never ending. It's an amazing bit of grace that God shows us there, isn't it? Well, I want us to sing the song before we're dismissed today, before we end our time together today. And I, as we sing it, I really want us to all to focus in on these words. I want you to sing it like it is your first time hearing this song. I, I want us to accept and really marinate in that amazing grace of our Heavenly Father. Because let me tell you, no matter how long you walk with Jesus, no matter how many times you've sung this song, His grace is still amazing. Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I am found. Twas blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed When we've been there ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you for the gift of your amazing grace. Help us, Lord, to live in light of this amazing grace in everything that we do, in every circumstance we find ourselves in, in every trial that we go through, in every victory we celebrate. Help us to remember your amazing grace. Help us, Lord. Help us to share that grace everywhere we go because grace is an amazing thing. The more we share it, the more we have. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Help us to be your servants. Use us, Father, for your kingdom. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Y'all have a blessed day. We look forward to seeing you Sunday. Sunday.